Getting the exposure to grow your small wedding business can be difficult. With millions of engaged couples using The Knot to plan their weddings and find vendors, advertising on our sites will connect you with more couples than anywhere else online. Meet engaged couples where they're already searching for vendors like you. And let us deliver leads to help you grow your business. Visit vendors.thenot.com slash podcast to sign up today. Mention code PODCAST15 during your free onboarding session for 15% off your first month. Hello, and thank you for listening to The History of World War II Podcast, Episode 393, Interview with James Schoen, the host of the Taiwan Through Time podcast. Today, James joins us to discuss what was happening in Taiwan, or Formosa as it was called by the Japanese, before and during World War II. James's podcast, Taiwan Through Time, is a detailed account of the history of the island of Taiwan from the dawn of humanity to present day. James, thank you very much for being with us today. Oh, well, thank you for having me on the show. Absolutely. I'm very excited that you're here because as, as we were talking previously and we've exchanged emails, being a young lad many, many, many years ago reading James Clavel, you know, you fall in love with, with the history and the culture. And when I saw that your podcast had come along, the history of Taiwan or TaiwanThroughTime.com, I just knew that I was going to be listening to that. So I'm glad you have this experience uh, and the time and the talent. Uh, to do the podcast. So if I could, this is going to sound weird uh, to start out with, but um, yep. can you give the listeners and I, for everybody who doesn't have a map in front of them right now, give, give us a basic idea of where Taiwan is relative to other countries. Uh, okay, so we're in Southeast Asia mm -hmm. and we centered on China. Right. So everyone, or most people know where China is. Exactly. If you go... Yeah. East and slightly north, you've got Japan mm -hmm. next to Korea. And if you go down southeast, you hit the Philippines. Right. And so north of the Philippines, southwest of Japan, and east of China is where Taiwan is. Right. It's, uh, in terms of actual mainland, it's closest to China, mm -hmm. but it's sort of equidistant between China and the last island in the Ryukyu chain, which is a little string of islands which include Okinawa, which technically belonged to Japan. Right. Although previously they didn't. Mm. And then it's slightly further away from the Philippines. So it's sort of in that triangle. Right. I'm, no, I'm glad you did that because the, – and that reminded me when I was covering – when the, the Japanese troops come to the Philippines, the, the morning or the day of that uh, MacArthur's Air Force is almost wiped out on December 8th. You know, they flew in from Formosa, the, you know, mm. modern day Taiwan. And uh, it's like, I have to know more about this because it was it was a major base. And that led me to think, why were the Japanese there in the first place? And so you're here to fill in all the gaps that I have. Uh, but before we get started with that, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and why you decided that life was too good and you wanted to be miserable, so you became a podcaster? <laughs> oh, all right. Well, um, I'm, I'm a South African, mm -hmm. but uh, I mean, I've lived on three different continents. At right. the moment, I've been in Taiwan for over a decade. Wow. Uh, I'm qualified as an English and history teacher, mm -hmm. although I tend to spend more time teaching English because that makes sense. You, you're in Asia, that's what they want from you. Right. And so I found that I wasn't getting enough of my own, you know, that, that draw for history that I wanted. Mm -hmm. So I started reading up on uh, Taiwan. I got a book called um, Forbidden Nation, mm -hmm. which is a fairly brief history of Taiwan written by a Canadian, actually. And I found it really interesting. And I thought, well... I live here. Mm -hmm. I should know a little bit more about it. So I started researching. I thought, this is great. I'm going to make a podcast from the dawn of time, essentially, up until today. Right. I and it, uh, yeah. Just real quick, let me, someone who's trying to cover a lot of World War II, and I've been called crazy, let me call you crazy in my turn. You're trying to cover from the dawn of, of history of humanity to present day. You might be at this for a while. Well, not actually, because mm -hmm. there are no, mostly, there are no written records about Taiwan oh. before the 1600s. Right. Oh, okay. Because it was sort of 
left out and ignored. And the local people here didn't have any form of writing until the Dutch arrived, which is odd because the people, some of the people in the Philippines did have a crude form of writing. Mm-hmm. But no one had it here, so we only have archaeological records and um, DNA analysis and that kind of thing to try and track what happened previously. And then a few notes written by explorers from China or Japan saying, oh, they passed this island or <laughs> they met some locals and did some trading. Right. So I pretty much have like a few episodes just discussing general stuff from the past. Mm-hmm. And then I'm in the late 1500s. That makes sense. Actually, when I was um, uh, just the other day when I was walking my dog, I was listening to your episode 10 where the Dutch get involved. And uh, the Dutch and the Portuguese, very widespread empires, you know, possessions and outposts mm. and whatever. But that, that's really what I was looking forward to. And I and again, I, you know, I didn't know that. I mean, it makes sense. It's a little island off of the, you know, the, the mainland where a lot more exciting things are happening. But I guess it's fair to say that Taiwan has certainly become a lot more important to a lot of people than it was previously. Yes. I mean, when the – I'm just getting this book out of the way. Mm-hmm. When the Chinese first took over Taiwan, um, this was when they eventually kicked out the Dutch, which right. was the – mid 1600s, mm. China was going through a civil war. Right. I, actually, it was going through an invasion because mm. you had the Ming dynasty, which was the Chinese dynasty, mm-hmm. and they were being invaded by Manchuria, who eventually became the Qing dynasty. Right. And the Ming dynasty loyalists were losing and you know, appointing new emperors and then losing them as well. So they fled to Taiwan mm. to try and, and kicked out the Dutch. And said, right, let's build up an army here to go back and invade. But the Qing ended up invading Taiwan and defeating them. And then was like, okay, now we've got this horrible island (laughs) full of savage people. We don't want it. But if we leave it, the Ming loyalists might reform and attack us. Or someone else might take it and use it as a base to attack China. So they kept it, but they didn't really administer it very well. And they didn't really care about it. Right. It was an afterthought. Yeah, and that happened for like 200 years. Wow. And well, then yeah, yeah. the Japanese got it. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, before we jump into that, let me ask real quick, and I did not mean to cut you off. I apologize. Was there anything um, else you wanted to tell us about your background? You're, you're from South Africa. You've traveled. Um, is, is there anything? I, I just wanted to make sure I didn't leave anything out. Oh, um, yeah. I'm, I'm one of these people of, of uh, the generation where everyone seems to be moving again. Right. You know, it's a it's a bit like the uh, I forget exactly which age it was, but the time of the Fulkenwanderum in Europe. You know, the the time of wandering people, where mm-hmm. everyone's like, "Well, this sucks. Let's go somewhere else." <laughs> and you can. And yeah. my family and, and my extended family is now spread across five continents. Wow. So it's <laughs> South Africa is still my home, mm-hmm. but in a way, most of my home is no longer in South Africa. Ah, I've got some people there and I've got right. some people in, in Europe and Canada and Australia and just the Hong Kong. We're all over the place. Right. And so yeah. I like to try and get international perspectives on things because it's uh, that's the way of the world nowadays. Absolutely. That's that's the best way to go. And so I imagine each Christmas is very interesting for you having family members scattered all over the place. Oh, well, for Christmas, I'm at work because there is no Christmas here. Oh, See, that's my Western yeah. uh, programming. Uh, well, well, there is Christmas here, right? But only commercially. Oh, <laughs> if we can. The make Taiwanese some... are like, oh yeah, we'll take Christmas <laughs> and and we'll take uh, Halloween and we'll take these things, but right. only for commercial purposes right. and dressing up at school for, right. for children, if if we care about it. We'll sell stuff. Oh my god. We gosh. have to wait until what what they call the Chinese New Year, the Lunar New Year. Right. Which is usually late January, early February. And then we get about a week's holiday. Gotcha. Okay. And that's, that's, that's everyone. Schools usually have a few extra weeks then. Right. But yeah, the schools only have two holidays. They have the winter holiday and the summer holiday and that's it. Wow. And the summer holiday is longer. It's like, can be as long as two months. Right. But lots of children end up going to cram schools and spending their time working anyway. 
Ah, uh, yes, the um, the quasi religion of education and bettering yourself. That is something that I do admire. Uh, my my girls complain about homework or whatever, and I'm like, uh, you don't no, you don't have any right to complain. But they don't, you know, it's all context. It's all relative. They don't understand about some people are literally using education as a way to get to the next rung of the ladder in a very aggressive fashion. Well, that, as we'll find, actually does happen in. in time on history under the Japanese rule. Right. But as for nowadays, uh, I think it's a Chinese mentality, which the Taiwanese have obviously got because they're mostly Chinese people here, mm -hmm. where you shouldn't waste time. Everything mm -hmm. must be scheduled. There must be something filling in. So when they go on like their package tours, right. quote unquote, playtime, especially for children, is factored in. Right. Uh, from this time to this time, you will have fun. Go play. And then after that, come back, because now we've got a lecture on this, and then after we've got this. Right. It's efficient. Uh, it's efficient. And, and it's the same when it comes to school time. So it's like, okay, right. you go to school, and you finish at 4 o'clock or whatever, mm -hmm. which is quite late for grade, for, you know, grade 2 to 5 or whatever. You know, Finish at 4 o'clock. Okay, what happened to your day? Right. But then the parents are still working, so you go to a cram school. And the cram school have to show that it's worth the parents' while to send the children there. So they give you homework, and then sometimes they go to two cram schools, and there's more homework. Plus, they have homework from school. Then they get home, have to try finish that homework, and then you know from from your primary school, you're going to bed at like ten, eleven o'clock at night, and that's considered normal. Oh my goodness! I mean, I knew I you hear things, but I had no idea it was that uh, mapped out, if you will. Well, the, yeah, there's a there's a level of I want to improve and learn stuff, mm -hmm. and then there's a level of well, now I'm just jaded and don't care about education anymore. Good point. There is a, there's a fine line uh, yeah. that, could, that could be crossed. I mean, it, it does make them efficient in a way. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they're quite good at getting things done. Right. But it also means that they don't have as much – In okay, it depends on the person. Right. But generally, they don't have as much creativity. It's more, tell me what the answer is. I need to know the answer. Write it down. None of this. There could be possibly multiple answers. You need to explore the idea yourself. It's like, no, there's one answer. I must get it. I must write it down. <laughs> the older you get, the more gray and shades of gray uh, life is. So uh, good luck with that. But, uh, but obviously, when it comes to education or mathematics, yeah, you can have an answer. But yeah, life tends to be gray or different perspectives, yeah. I guess. Well, even with mathematics, uh, I think they, they're taught to write their equations in a very specific way. So if you're timesing numbers, right. uh, I think maybe you have to put the bigger number first or something. I, I'm not quite sure. Right. They have a system you know, for eight that time, too. Eight times three is not the same as three times eight because eight times three puts the bigger number first and that's the correct way. Or right. I think it's the bigger number first. And they sort of just, because they're so drilled, mm -hmm. It's very difficult for them to think outside the box. Like if you go to a restaurant and you, I don't know, you order some sort of sandwich and you're like, well, I don't really like, uh, I don't know, the, the pickles or something. <laughs> right. Could you take that off and put something else on, in, on instead? They get really flustered. Like, oh, I, I don't know. I have to call the manager. We might have to charge you extra. Right. B because changing things or going against the norm in those kind of, you know, where there's a stock standard way of doing it, right. they get very unsure of things. They're that, very rigid in following policy. Right. That that reminds me of so many of the messages between, Ver, you know, Nimitz and MacArthur, whatever, as they're taking on the Japanese. They did figure that out about them, about when a plan doesn't go according to plan, they get flustered. And, and so the Americans really focused on messing with their plans just because it would there would be a breakdown. Uh, they, they weren't sure what to do next. So, so we'll, we'll, we'll talk about some of that. But so it sounds like these people are quite fascinating. Uh, there's a lot to envy. So let's jump into this. So and you, you kind of touched on this a couple of minutes ago. But how does Japan come to own or control whatever the proper word is Taiwan? All right. Well, um, technically, Japan has wanted Taiwan for quite a while. It's at the end of the Ryukyu Island chain, which they have always considered theirs. Uh, previously was a vassal state um, centered on Ryukyu, which is uh, Okinawa. Right. But then they eventually annexed it all. Uh, actually, just a few years before they took Taiwan. Uh, well, a, a few decades, I think. But Taiwan, they've wanted since, or well, some of them have wanted since about the 1500s. Wow. They actually sent out expeditions to try and, you know, 
because Japanese people had migrated for various bits of trade and were working elsewhere. So there were little Japanese settlements in Taiwan. Okay. Well, back when it was Formosa, officially. Right. And so a trade declaration was sent to the Philippines, you know, to demand tribute for Japan. And then they stopped in Taiwan and said, right, you have to go find the leader of the Japanese settlement and force them to submit to the home rule of China, uh, Japan. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we're going to invade. Wow. And they arrived and found that it was such a disorganized thing with no leadership, there was no leader to hand it to. Right. So he stood around awkwardly for a while and then left. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. And then, yeah, and then, um, I don't know, maybe a decade after that, maybe a bit more, right. um, one of the Japanese unifiers, because there are three, like, great unifiers of Japan, mm -hmm. he sent uh, an attack force to take Taiwan by force, and their ships hit a typhoon. So only one got there, badly damaged. Right. It arrived at one of the little Japanese settlements. The natives saw this and thought, this is great. They attacked, and there was a huge battle. And they managed to chase the natives off because the natives were largely doing it for headhunting. Mm -hmm. And then they got back on their ship and limped home. And the emperor was so annoyed, he executed the leader and his family. Oh. And then they like, okay, we're not going to bother now because they had then just failed to invade Korea. And it was looking really bad for them. So they're like, okay, no more external invasions. Mm. And then that got shut down all the way up until the late 1800s. And in fact, in fact the reason why Japan got Taiwan mm -hmm. was because of Korea. Really? Because China had made Korea a vassal state. Right. But Japan wanted to open up Korea for trade because it benefited them. Mm. So they, they basically, China and Japan were both fighting over Korea. And then they agreed to have a sort of peace settlement where they would stand back and not fight each other and both sort of do trade with Korea. And then in Korea, there was a civil war. Well, it wasn't really a civil war. There, someone attempted a coup. They tried to kill off the king. Right. And they managed to stop the coup, but there was a bit of an uprising. So they called upon China to send their troops and to help. And when the Chinese troops came in, the Japanese said, hey, you, you just broke our treaty. So they sent troops in. But what had happened in the interim was Japan had been modernizing itself and it had gone through a really a, a rapid eight year development course to build itself up economically and industrially and you know, essentially modernize. Right. So when Japan and China went to war, everyone was like, China's going to wipe the floor with them. <laughs> and then battle after battle, all the victories went to the Japanese. And everyone's like, whoa, whoa, what the hell is going on? Where did Japan come from? Mm -hmm. And so Japan sued for peace. No, sorry, China sued for peace. And they signed an armistice. You know, let's, let's not fight while we work this out. Right. But they very carefully left out Taiwan and the Penghu Islands from this armistice. Oh. Now, the Penghu Islands are, um, in English, we call them the pescadores. And they're a small group of islands between Japan, as I said, between Taiwan and mainland China. Okay. I think they're slightly closer to Taiwan. Mm. So while the trade negotiations were going on, Japan invaded the Penghu Islands, the, the Pescadores, and took those. So it cut off all resupplies to Taiwan. Clever. And then in the demands at their, um, their meeting, they said, look, we control the Pescadores. We've surrounded Taiwan. You will give us Taiwan and a little bit of land in China itself. And you will agree that Korea is an independent country. You do not control it, so it can have free trade with us. Wow. That's aggressive. And yeah. It was very aggressive. That was the, the first Sino-Japanese war. That was uh, 1894 to 1895. Right. So in 1895, they signed the Treaty of Shomonoseki, because that was the place they met up in Japan. Mm -hmm. So yeah, China recognized Korean independence, stepped back and said, okay, you're not a vassal state anymore. Japan got uh, the Pescadores, Taiwan, and in China, the Laodong Peninsula, because it gave them more ports and more access to trade around the area. Yeah, I mean, anybody who, who knows about this general history, you know, the Americans show up uh, in Japan, uh, Commodore Perry with our gunboat saying, hey, we're here to trade and to do other stuff. And you're not going to say no, because we have a superior, you know, 
warfare or technology or weapons. J Japan learns from us as far as uh, industrialization, and now they're using it against the the uh, the Chinese, and it's paying off for them. They suddenly have <clears throat> uh, all this territory. So, but it, but again, I, I have to be curious. So they've got Taiwan, or they're going to get Taiwan, but it's full of you know Chinese people. How do you control <laughs> a population of another group of people that may not want to be controlled by you? Oh well, that that's one of the interesting things about it. So we've got. Taiwan is heavily mountainous. Mm -hmm. So going down the center of the island and large parts of the east are mountainous areas. Mm. And as you've had more people like the Dutch and the, uh, the Ming Dynasty and the Qing Dynasty arrive, mm -hmm. the indigenous people, some who were on the western plains, stayed there and sort of got incorporated. Right. But most of the ones living in the mountains stayed separate. And so – that was still considered wild territory. Mm -hmm. So the Chinese settlers uh, largely stuck to the west coast, going from Taipei in the north, down the west coast, down to Tainan today, mm -hmm. which is the Unping area where the Dutch first settled. Right. And so the island was never considered you know, an entire territory controlled by any one person. It was always a bit of a well, we own part of it, and technically we own the rest, but we don't because there are others who live there, and right. we can't be bothered dealing with them because when you're trying to attack people in a, in a, a hugely forested area in the mountains yeah. where they have many, many villages and hamlets dotted around the place, and you don't know where they are, yeah. and trying to go there, everything is guerrilla warfare – you're just not going to take the place. so And it's going to cost a lot, and you're going to lose anyway. And they're, they they are there to make money. I mean, like you said, it was all about trade. You, you take uh, different uh, land so you can expand your trading empire. Yeah, you don't, you don't spend a lot of money on guerrilla warfare and lose. I think that was very wise of them to accept the reality of the situation. Mm. So they pretty much stuck to the West Coast, and let's just control this. Mm -hmm. Now... The Chinese people who were there were quite an interesting mix right? because they'd been traveling to the island oh, for over 600 years. The Taiwanese – in okay, when I talk about Taiwanese, I mean everyone. Mm -hmm. And then when I specifically talk about the Taiwanese indigenous, it will be the Austronesian people of various descent who inhabit there and all across the Pacific. Okay. And – when I talk about the Taiwanese Chinese people, then it's the people of, of Chinese descent, mostly from Han descent. Mm -hmm. okay, I know we're getting to ethnic, uh, ethic, uh, blah, ethnicities now, right. but the Han people are not just one people. There are also subgroups and largely due to discrimination for some groups, people started migrating to Taiwan. Uh, so we actually have, especially at that time, you had like, three different forms of chain of Chinese being spoken in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, they all have slightly different grammar, slightly different vocab. You have the, the Hokkien people from Fujian. So you have Hokkien Chinese or Hokkien Taiwanese. Mm -hmm. Actually, I think it's usually called Taiwanese Hokkien the other way. Then you've got Hakka, which is another version. And then with the Qing invasion, you've got, the Qing's version of Chinese, which was meant for the government exams. Right. So it was a very literary, poetic version of language. And everyone pronounced it differently. Because oh. they all got the same written words, but in their own versions, they would have different pronunciations for things. Then you had like 16 different indigenous languages. <laughs> now, they have a much smaller population, right. but it is quite a, a diversity between them. Yeah. So there was no real... Taiwanese identity. But the people there were largely, okay, we were under Chinese rule, so we and we're sort of Chinese descent. So yeah, technically we belong to China, even though communication's a bit slow. And then they hear, oh, China has given us up to Japan. Oh wow. So So they're like Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Were they more angry at the, their new uh, leaders or are they more angry at the Chinese for abandoning them or giving – I mean that's, that's, pretty, that's a pretty raw deal. It them. is a raw deal. I, I think they were more angry at Japan yeah. because, you know, better the devil you know. Yes. But they decided, okay, well, 
we're not going to stand for this. So this treaty was signed in April, I think the 17th of April. Mm -hmm. So on the 25th of May, a group got together and declared themselves the new government, the Republic of Formosa. And this is 1895. Just want to make 1895. Okay. All right, thank you. Yeah, and they're like, saw these Japanese who haven't even arrived yet. Right. We're declaring if China doesn't want us, fine. We're our own people. Mm. No yeah, one's going to like that. Japan or China <laughs> is not going to like that. Well, it's a, it's a bit of a slap in the face to China and Japan. Yeah. It just means well, they're going to have to come in with force. Yes. Yeah. And based on the uh, the I keep mixing these up. Based on the Japanese political system at the time, mm -hmm. th there was quite a bit of a struggle between the politicians in the political area and the military in the political area. Mm. <clears throat> and uh, this plays quite an important role, but th there's constant sort of factionalism and fighting, not literal fighting, just political fighting right. to see who has more power. The people who say they stand for the people or the military ones who control by martial law, essentially. Right. And the military were in control. So when they first went to Taiwan, they sent in the military, obviously. And the first governor general who was elected was a military individual. In fact, the first seven would all be military leaders. Wow. It would only come later with uh, various changes in politics in Japan that it changed to civilian politicians becoming leaders of Japan, uh, of Taiwan. Right. But that's setting the tone. When you send in a military leader, you're making it quite clear that you have certain priorities and you're expecting trouble and this guy is there to, if he has to, you know, break some heads. But, yeah, sending a military leader is certain. I mean, I know that the military in Japan was very powerful, very influential, but doesn't that send a message to be sending a man in uniform to control your, new, your home? Mm, it does. <clears throat> And I, I assume the Japanese thought they had to do that right. because they're like, this island is ours. But in their minds, it's mostly inhabited by Chinese people, right. even if there are degrees of separation from the mainland. Mm -hmm. So they're like, OK, they sent in their forces in, also in May and they landed in the north in Geelong, which is actually a beautiful natural harbor. And it's where long, long ago the Japanese had one of their settlements. Right. And they took over that area and then very swiftly marched uh, southwest and took Taipei. Hmm. And at that stage, two things happened. A few of the leaders of the Republic of China, I, just, ah, I keep Formosa. doing this. A few of the leaders of the Republic of Formosa uh -huh. panicked, ran to the coast and fled to China. Right. And the remainders fled down south to Tainan and made that their capital. It's not a good start for the new Republic of Formosa. <laughs> no, not really. Right. So the Japanese said, okay, we've secured the north. We've got control of this area. Let's march our troops south. Mm -hmm. And the entire march south was constantly harassed by guerrilla warfare, trying to stop them from getting south. Right. But they eventually did. They managed to get down south. Mm -hmm. And then there were... There were it's a bit of confusion over dates here. Mm -hmm. They had the Battle of Bagua Shan. Uh, Shan is mountain, so it's the Bagua Mountain. Mm -hmm. And that's where the Republic of Formosa was thoroughly crushed. Right. And then soon after that, Tainan fell because they couldn't really resist anymore. And then Japan had control. Mm. Okay. But I've heard some people say the Republic of Formosa ended on the 21st of October and others saying on the 8th of November. I'm not yeah. quite sure why the two dates. Maybe one is the battle and one is the actual signing over or something. Could be. That makes sense, yeah. Because there's the physical uh, putting down of resistance and then the actual get mm. someone to sign a document saying this is now officially over. Mm. So who knows? Yeah. Yeah, so let's see. May to October. Yeah, that, that republic lasted very long. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So, so Japan, I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Was there more? No, no. Okay. Um, so, so Japan has now got control more or less of uh, Formosa. Um, can you tell us about Goto Shinpai and what influence he had on Taiwan? All right. Yes. Uh, one thing I want to add just before yes, that, because this is also kind of important. Yeah. 
Although the Republic of Formosa collapsed, right. the following month in December, an anti-Japanese movement started up, another one, mm -hmm. and this one was less organized, so therefore it was harder to track down. Ah. And it was mostly comprised of people who were Qing loyalists, you know, we are still Chinese, mm -hmm. and they're anti-Japanese, and it was pretty much a volunteer army. And they were, again, doing armed resistance. Let's get weapons and fight. Right. And that would actually last for about seven years until they were eventually put down. Mm. But the whole time this was happening, the Japanese were always using aggressive method, uh, methods. Right. Let's go in there. Let's fight. Let's kill. Let's force people to do what we want. And, yeah, this is where Goto Shinpei comes in because I'm sure there's a proper Japanese way to pronounce his name that I don't know. Right. <laughs> I think it's Goto. I think that's a rising O, but whatever. Mm -hmm. Goto Shinpei was not a military figure. Mm -hmm. He was actually trained as a doctor. Right. And there was a thing called the Satsuma Rebellion, which has nothing to do with um, fruit. It was just the name of the area. Right. Maybe it's the, where the, the fruit gets its name from. But uh, there was a rebellion there in 1877, and he worked very hard in this rebellion as a doctor, distinguished himself as a medic, and so came to the, uh, the attention of various people. And he joined the home ministry in the medical bureau. This is all in Japan. Mm -hmm. And he eventually became the head and was publishing various articles. And his good work came to the attention of Kodama Gintaro, who was the army vice minister. And he's like, okay, I, you're a great guy. You know what you're doing. Right. Post-Sino-Japanese War, you're in charge of the Army Quarantine Office to make sure that we don't poison the homeland when everyone comes back. Right. And Kodama Gintaro would become the fourth governor general of Taiwan. Mm. And so when he became governor general, he's like, okay, I want Goto with me. Right. So he asked him to come and join him. And there's a particular reason as well, because early on in 1896, Goto had written a law and managed to get it passed mm -hmm. called Law Number 63. Now, Taiwan was taken over by Japan, so technically it fell under Japanese law, right? which meant all the subjects in Taiwan would technically fall under Japanese law as well and have to be treated that way. Law Number 63 allow Taiwan to be run separately. It's under Japanese control, but it doesn't fall under Japanese law. Its rulers or its leaders can run it in their own way, Ooh. thus giving them special administrative power. Right. Well, and, that, that could be good or bad. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. And that, two years after that is when Godama Gintaro became the new governor general. Okay. Now you have, you essentially have two leaders. You have the governor general, who's basically in charge of the whole island and the military and everything. Right. And then you have the chief of home affairs, who's more in charge of the, and I'm not quite sure, the social political aspects, more dealing directly with the people than dealing with governance as, uh, as a whole. Okay. He appointed Goto to that position. And it was the first time a civilian held it, not a military officer. Right. And yeah, so Goto decided, okay, what do we need on this island? Right. Well, it's a tropical island. It's riddled with disease. Yeah. Sanitary anything doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. I'm a doctor. What do I think needs to happen here? So he's like, okay, first thing we need to do is we need to get clean drinking water, and a proper working sewerage system. Right. Makes sense. So for this, he brought William Kinnamond Burton. Who's and as not, you can tell, but who's not who's Japanese. Not Japanese. <laughs> no. Sorry. As you, can, as you can tell by the name Burton, he's <laughs> Scottish. Right. Yeah. Sorry. Now, <clears throat> he was essentially a self-taught water engineer. And the Japanese liked him and invited him to Tokyo to lecture at the university. Mm -hmm. uh, in theory, he was there to lecture as a basic engineer. But in practice, he was there to teach sewerage engineering. 
because it's something that Japan desperately needed in terms of their modernization. Mm -hmm. So when Goto went to Taiwan, he's like, I want this guy to come with me. And he is going to set up and develop the infrastructure for drinking water and sewerage in Taiwan, which he did. I mean, obviously, they started in the major cities and then slowly migrated outwards. But the main reason for this was to try and cut down on sickness and disease and just to make the place healthier. Because compared to China, things on Taiwan were actually quite backwards. Mm. It was, I mean, even if today, if you go to some of the outer lying islands in the Philippines, right. you find very undeveloped areas. Um, usually you get running water now, but lots of places don't have electricity or they only do for like, four hours every day or something. Right. Uh, it's a much more subsistence kind of lifestyle, except for the one or two, you know, giant, uh, uh, what are those things called? <laughs> uh, it's lodges, you know, that some American or European oh. has come in and built up like, hey, right. come experience the wild by staying in our five-star <laughs> restaurant in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> that's where I would go, so I can't say anything. That That's me roughing it, so I can't. I can't say. It. Yeah. Taiwan was pretty much like that. Mm -hmm. Sans any water uh, pumping systems and sans any electricity. Right. It's got a way so to it was, go. Wow. Yeah. So the other thing he said is, okay, we also need medicine. So in Taipei, he set up a hospital and a medical college. Mm -hmm. And then scattered around the islands, he set up various clinics oh. that could deal with various diseases to keep people safe. I mean... Right. Yes, there were things like malaria, uh, cholera was a big problem. Um, somewhere in my notes, I've got a few other things that were. But yeah, there were certain diseases they needed to take care of, and they needed a continuous supply of medicine to treat it so it didn't get out of hand. Ah. And they're like, okay, if we can set this up, right. then we can stabilize this, this island. So it sounds like Japan is investing a lot in Taiwan. What is Japan getting out of this? I mean, why are they there? What's what's their goal? Well, for some of the Japanese, mm -hmm. uh, they've always pictured Taiwan as being at least an ally of them, right. if not part of them. Ah. Okay. So if you see it as an ally, well, China is there stopping us from doing trade with them. So we need to free them, liberate them right. by enslaving them ourselves. Right. But others saw them as part of the Ryukyu chain, even though it's much larger than any of the other islands there. I think it's 40 times bigger than Okinawa, mm -hmm. something like that. Right. And in fact, of all the, during Japan's co-prosperity sphere that it developed, Taiwan was the only place that they actually sent the, the well, not, not the reigning monarch, at the time he was the prince. Right. It was the only place that he made a formal visit to, to show how much wow. Taiwan was part of the Japanese um, world and, and part of Japan. Right. I mean, he, he did visit one other place that was, quote unquote, colonized. Mm -hmm. But it was a place that already was settled by the Japanese. It just wasn't formally part of Japan. Gotcha. Um, so it sounds like for some people, for some Japanese, this was almost a form of uh, patriotism. This is ours. Let's bring them into the fold. Let's let's improve their lives. Let's modernize the facilities. So mm. th there's that. And then there's probably the more, how should I put this, um, capitalist thinking people who maybe want to take their food or use it for trade or something like that. Mm. Well, food is a good thing. The the first priority in terms of agriculture, right. actually, actually, agriculture was one of the first priorities. Mm -hmm. That started long before Goto arrived. Uh -huh. They said, we need to get this island producing stuff for us. Right. So there was a huge focus uh, initially on rice and sugar, but later this would expand into other things. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason they wanted rice, obviously, is because it's the... Um, uh, what's it called? The main diet, the main food that people eat there. In fact, in Japan, during the... Okay, we are still sort of in the time of the samurai, but when you're properly in the time of the samurai, right. their salary was paid in rice. 
Gotcha. So the more rice you had, the more money you had because you could use it to pay off other people. Right. It's like principle. So we need yeah. yeah, we need rice to feed people and we need sugar because it's a global commodity. It's a cash crop. Right. Yeah. They later added other various things to this as well. Um, can't remember off the top of my hand. I've got to look it up. One of them was uh, camphor. I remember that, the various trees. Mm -hmm. But they had trouble in getting it because when they went to the trees to tap them, it was in the forests and they would often then get attacked by the indigenous. Right. And the indigenous would be like, no, get away from our trees. Get off our land kind of thing. Yeah. And <laughs> that was always kind of difficult. It is easy to argue, and I, I would believe it, mm -hmm. that Taiwan was completely modernized by Japan in terms of industry, in terms of uh, economy, and in terms of Taiwanese identity. Ah. But we'll get to that a bit later. Okay. So, so there right. is some good coming for, for the locals from the Japanese. They are modernizing this. Um, but, but at the same time, it's not like uh, Taiwan can, or Formosa can go, you know what? We want to be on our own. Would you please let us go? So um, they're a part of the Japanese empire, but they're certainly not going to go anywhere, uh, even if they wanted to. <clears throat> oh, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So yeah. Uh, scholars separate Japanese colonial rule into three phases. Okay. Yeah. The first phase is 1895 to 1915. Mm -hmm. And during this time, there was only military leaders of the island. Everything was pretty much do as we say or we shoot you kind of thing. And forcing the people to accept rule. Mm. It also included a pacification attempt uh, or campaign against the savage interior because they were having a lot of trouble, especially with the Atayal people in the north, just attacking them, not listening to them, murdering lots of their people. Because they, I think, still practiced headhunting at the time. Wow. Or some of the groups did. Right. And part of the ending of the first phase was Goto Shinpei saying, we need to have a proper land survey done. Mm -hmm. And this land survey was insane. Because, <laughs> yeah, it really wasn't insane. Because they said, okay, we are going to employ uh, as many people as we need. Right. And it worked out to something like 1.6 million people dealing with this land survey. That's crazy. And when you do land surveys, I mean, I looked it up for the USA. Mm -hmm. You generally have one person per every 20,000 people doing these sorts of surveys and yeah. censuses of the people. In Taiwan, it was something like one to every 500. Wow. And, yeah, they did lose a lot of people because they said, okay, we want – I mean, I know the map is not the territory. Mm -hmm. But they wanted absolutely everything in the territory on some map. Right. So they went out there. They found every single little hamlet, village, town, every river, every mountain, and everything was catalogued. They even found something like – 50% or a third more farms that the Qing dynasty didn't know about and weren't taxing Ooh. because they just hadn't bothered to look. Right. They just thought they knew what was there. So it's like that was great for revenue. Okay, yes. now we know what we control. We can now run it efficiently. Mm -hmm. Some people are like, yeah, we can tax them better. Right. Other people are like, yes, we can use the land. Mm -hmm. And yeah, part of that was also then fighting against the Atayal. Now, when those indigenous people attacked, they would then scatter and you don't know where they are. Mm. Once everything was catalogued, they knew exactly where every town and village was. They knew where they were probably hiding out and they could just march up to that village and arrest them. Oh. So there was nowhere to hide anymore. Right. Yeah, that's, I mean, it's, it's good. Um, so we can farm more, we can tax more, but we can also track down um, rebels. And so this is, even though it sounds like it was a monumental undertaking, this is this is actually working out for the for the Japanese to have all this more information, additional information. Mm, and that's also why uh, by 1902 they were able to uh, curtail the other armed resistance because they were able to find where some of these people were hiding. Ah, okay. But then there was a change in 1915, so the end of the first phase. 
there was a big armed uprising by a combination of the Taiwanese Han Chinese people and the indigenous. Mm -hmm. This is called the Tapani incident. And, well, I mean, going to try to keep this short. Essentially, they failed. Right. And a lot of people were arrested. Uh, some people were executed. But it pretty much brought an end to armed resistance against the Japanese. Ah, uh, they finally broke the rebels back, so, so to mm. speak. So the next phase, all resistance would then become intellectual and political rather than armed resistance. Okay. Yeah, so there's the second phase for the Japanese was all about extending the land inwards. Right. We've broken the armed resistance. Let's go and take over what's left, finish up the land surveys, and see what minerals and land we have to exploit. Mm. And they quickly realized, well, if we control this island and we want to control it effectively, mm -hmm. we need to be able to move our troops around the island. And we need to be able to move the resources that we're harvesting or developing. Mm. So they said, okay, right. we need roads. We need railway. We need tunnels. Uh, I think when they arrived, there was something like 50 kilometers of railway. Wow. And within a very short time, it jumped up to like 500. Right. They dug a lot of um, early tunnels in those days, mainly for transporting uh, mining stuff. Mm. Uh, nowadays you have some better tunnels and the old tunnels and our little walkways people can go through or bike lanes, right? which is kind of fun. But they also decided we need to get roads all the way across the island so that we can march out or drive our troops very quickly across the island if we need to. Right. Because if, you know, an attack comes in the south, we don't want to load everyone onto a ship and try and slowly sail around the island. We right. want to just rush down there quickly. This sounds like it's going to disrupt a lot of people's lives, building roads and railroads and tunnels. It sounds like. Oh, yeah. In, in some ways, it was very disruptive. Right. But also, especially when it came to the central and west, uh, eastern side, it was very sparsely populated. So you weren't always interfering with other people's lives. Ah. Mm -hmm. But on the west coast, where it was flatter land and more people there, there was a bit more disruption, obviously. Mm-hmm progress <laughs> progress <laughs> you gotta deal with it yeah yeah now when the japanese arrived people were already harvesting coal and sulfur mm -hmm. and they knew that there was petroleum but they weren't really harvesting it right so the japanese jumped on that and then they found gold and then they found copper and then they found cement oh. and then they found marble now this this idea doesn't always uh go together in people's minds, but right. Taiwan has one of the biggest marble deposits in the world. Wow. It is one of their biggest exports now. Uh, I think cement is probably their biggest, mm -hmm. followed by marble. But it, it's a growing industry, and it's actually – because when you think of Taiwan, you don't automatically think of marble. No, not at all. But, yeah, cement is a great one, and the Japanese needed the cement to industrialize. To build up. And, and today, cement is sold all over. I mean, they, they sell it to Australia, they sell it to Indonesia, especially Indonesia, where they've got lots of, because there they're trying to modernize as well. Mm -hmm. It sounds like Japan, uh, without really knowing about it, you know, um, sh struck it rich. I mean, this island has so many different uh, various things to offer. And we are talking about trade. We are talking about building up an economy. So this is, this is a very good thing for the Japanese, maybe not so much for the people on the island itself. Well, or give and take, I guess. You say that at first, mm -hmm. one of the problems was the cost involved. Right. Now in Japan, there were huge political arguments about what to do with Taiwan. Some people said, oh, no, it's part of us. It's, it's part of Japan. We need to look after it. We need to secure it. We need to make it ours. Yeah. Others are like, sod it. Sell it. <laughs> we, can get, we, can, we can sell it for a billion yuan. We can, we can sell it back to the Chinese or to anyone else. Right. We don't want it. And the reason was because in 1896, right. Taiwan, well, the, the colonial government could raise 2.7 million in taxes. But Taiwan was costing them 6.9 million. Oh. 
Even I know so, that's not good math. <laughs> it was a huge expense for them. Right. I mean, obviously, if you want to modernize and industrialize, that's going to cost a lot of money. Yes. But once it's happened, that's great. Right. But a lot of politicians in Japan were saying, we can't afford that now. Get rid of the place. Right. And so that. when we entered the second phase, mm -hmm. people started playing on this. But to mention that, I've got to go back to education. <laughs> okay, please. Okay, so <clears throat> the standard form of education that we have, as we know, is based on the Prussian system. Mm -hmm. Get people in large classes, teach them minimal stuff, and then get them out into the workplace where they can do stuff for their capitalist overlords. Right. Japan started doing that in Taiwan. Let's offer education. But they only offered primary schooling. Oh. So there's no high school. There's no university. Because they're not needed. Because they're not needed for the locals. Only, yeah. The only people who can take that are the uh, Japanese who are living in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, they started realizing that just using the stick method, do what I tell you or I hit you. Right isn't going to work. And they were actually at one point rather close to losing control of Taiwan. Wow. And so they introduced the carrot and stick method. And they went back, okay, okay, this is actually also Goto is doing. Right. Let's go back and find the original leaders of the various villages and tribes and people. Wow. And let's essentially bribe them to do what we want. Ah, like Get your people yeah. to follow our rule and we will give you your power, we'll let you keep your wealth, we'll even give you some advancements. And so doing this, yeah. they managed to control people. Also, there was a huge problem to do with land ownership in Taiwan. Right. And uh, for <laughs> sake of convenience, I'm just going to say it was very complicated. And largely, there were three levels. Mm -hmm. a person who owns the deed to a huge piece of land who then sublets various parts of it to other people, and then those people sublet even further to the ones who actually work on the land. Oh. And then the people work on the land and pay a small tax to the next person who pays a big tax to the next person. Right. Uh, it's, it's more complicated than that, but that's I'm the sure. basic understanding. I'm still a bit confused by it. Right, and you've been there for And the Japanese years. said, this is ridiculous, <laughs> firstly, because we don't know how to take control of the land ourselves, and secondly, because this is just nonsense. Right. So they essentially went in and cut out the top tier, oh. took that away from them and said, okay, the second tier, you own a piece of land, that is your land. Mm -hmm. And now you will pay us tax on it. Not based on how much is produced, but based on the size of the property. Right. And then you get people under you to work to pay us the taxes. So it's a bit more controlled. Yeah. And also by kicking out the top layer, the next level suddenly don't pay taxes to anyone. They're in charge. I mean, they pay taxes to the government, right. but they are probably not paying as much as they used to. And so now they're indebted to the Japanese for putting them in a better position. So the uh -huh. Japanese have an in with the landowners. Right. A little loyalty going on there. Yeah. Okay. So get the people on your side. Right. And then some of the, the people who were elites in Taiwan, whether through owning land or through being the leaders were able to get more money and thus get a better life for themselves, they could afford to send their children to places like Japan so they could get high school and they could get university. Mm. And so you started getting this formation of a Taiwanese elite within the society. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, the local people were, okay, Japanese was encouraged in schools and... Um, by the time of the Marco Polo incident, by the time we get to the second Sino-Japanese war between Japan and China, that's 1937, I think, mm -hmm. about 25% of the population was literate in Japanese, um, which is right. quite good. And I think they had about 35, 38% of people enrolled, of children enrolled in schools. So you bring the younger generations around, you get them speaking Japanese, they grow up, they're, they have a more, uh, I guess, a stronger, maybe a stronger connection to the home mm. island. So yeah, so at, at school, right. they spoke the Taiwanese version of Chinese and Japanese, mm. and then at home they would speak that Taiwanese and they would speak Mandarin. Right. 
but slowly Japanese was catching on. And the the problem is, if you're given basic education mm -hmm. and you are keen to learn, it's going back to what we mentioned previously, right. you want to be able to learn more, but there's no more school for you. Oh. So you have to try and find anything you can to learn more. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now, when the Japanese first came over, lots of them were avid newspaper readers. Right. But there were no newspapers in Taiwan. So they started importing newspapers from Japan. Uh, in their second year, uh, on the anniversary of taking over Taiwan, they set up their own local newspaper. I think in the end they set up a few local newspapers. Mm -hmm. But they were still importing many from Japan. And the local ones were a mix of Chinese and Japanese, but mostly Japanese. Mm -hmm. So if you wanted to read, you had to learn Japanese. Clever. But the Taiwanese used this to their advantage. Because they say, okay, I'm going to learn as much Japanese as I can. I'm going to constantly read the newspapers they bring us to improve my language, but mm -hmm. also to understand what's happening in Japan. Ah, uh, and when the elites, Sorry. yeah, when the elites are reading stuff about, oh, there's a political disagreement about Taiwan in Japan. We can exploit this. Yes, they started sending. Uh, see if I can find the name of the group. I've got it here somewhere. The Taiwan Cultural Association. They formed up in 1927 and they said, okay, we want essentially our own control of Taiwan. We want home rule. Mm -hmm. We want to rule Taiwan, not Jap Japan rule Taiwan. We want our own parliament, essentially. Mm. And, oh, sorry, that was, a, that was a society set up by this group. The, the main group is called the New People's Society. Right. Uh, Shin Min Kai. And that was set up in 1921. Sorry, they set up the Cultural Association later. Right. And so in 1921, they wrote a petition to the Japanese government asking for a Taiwanese parliament. Now, it's interesting that this wasn't just dismissed out of hand mm -hmm. because there were so, much, so many people on both sides of the political argument. This stayed in, Ta uh, in Japan. And over the course of, I think, 15 years, no, 13 years, was brought up 15 times for political debate. Wow. Now, it never got passed. Sure. But they had a lot of support for it in Japan. Interesting. And it, it's, it's interesting because they're using Japanese media and Japanese education against the Japanese. Again, clever. The other thing that happened is because everyone in Taiwan, or many people in Taiwan, right. are now reading these Japanese newspapers... Uh, whether locally produced or imported, most were imported still. I think mm. at the end, 60% were still imported. Mm. They were all reading the same thing, or for those who couldn't read Japanese, they were reading and then translating. They started getting a local vernacular developing. People were reading the same things. They started using the same words, the same grammatical structures, uh -huh. and it started to unify the people in the same way of thinking. They started to see themselves as Taiwanese, as a local group, right. because that's also how the Chinese, uh, the Japanese newspapers describe them. You know, oh, our Japanese boys out there on the, the local front in Taiwan, you know, well, dealing with the together. Taiwanese. Right. Okay, well, we, we're now identifying as Taiwanese. We're that's, seeing that's we similarities are. between ourselves that right. we never saw because we didn't have the Japanese here as a countermeasure. Yeah, if you can have a bigger outside threat, then it, it does tend to make people bond. And, and that goes back to, you know, before the Japanese came, there were no roads, there were scattered villages, everybody has their own sense of identity, or this, this is my village, this is what I know. Suddenly there's roads, there's communications, there's newspapers. So the Japanese needed that, but it also, like you said, the Taiwanese were able to use that, or it gets used and they start to develop their own identity. Mm. Independent identity, I guess. Yeah, and, and uh, it's, it's easy to look back at this time and go, oh, well, the Taiwanese who stuck together as Taiwanese, they're the good ones, and the ones who collaborated with the Japanese are the bad ones. Mm. But it was a very difficult time because right. a lot of people didn't have an identity in terms of society. Right. I mean, if, if you look at you know an extreme example, the indigenous, well, I know the people in my village. Yeah. I know them all firsthand. And I know there are various other villages around us, 
some of which we fight with, some of which we are in, in alliance with, and those those alliances change all the time. Right. But that's all I know. I don't know anything about the greater island itself, let alone the world. Right. And for the Taiwanese people, it was quite similar. Well, we're sort of Chinese, separated from a, for a while, but you know that that's my ethnicity. I mean, all the literature that we've read in Taiwan. Mm -hmm has all come from the historical Chinese sources that the, the Qing brought over because the Qing did not develop any Taiwanese literature or prose or anything. Right. The only thing that you could get was Taiwanese poetry because that was usually just written by individuals. But wow. the Qing didn't want to bother wasting money culturally developing Taiwan. So Taiwan only had old Chinese things that they read, like all the classics. Right. And that was the only connection they had as a people there wasn't really anything else that's an old and weak or relatively weak connection so yeah over time the japanese have got to be thinking as long as we can hold on to this island for a couple of decades time can be our ad, uh, our ally and bring mm. people over to us at least in theory so when you have the taiwanese elite especially the literary elite right they sort of divided into various camps one camp was Yes, let's control Taiwan ourselves. We will be the new rulers. Let's cut out the Japanese. We, we can be mm -hmm. a vassal state or something, but we must run ourselves. Right. And then you have others reading the old classics going, oh, we must be part of China. It's the motherland. It's, it's oh. like uh, you or I reading Shakespeare and going, we must unite with Britain. Right. It's like Shakespeare was quite a while ago. <clears throat> but, uh, <laughs> but it's a duality. Our, yes. Our, and, yeah. Sorry. And, and so they didn't. Any changes socially that were happening in China weren't happening in Taiwan. Right. I mean, that, that would change at the end of World War II when the Kuomintang landed in Taiwan. They invaded because, mm -hmm. well, in, I don't know if invaded is the right word. When they arrived, they brought two million people with them and an influx of modern Chinese culture. Wow. Yeah. But then, of course, in the years since then, the culturally Taiwan and, and Japan, China have drifted apart again. It's going through another divide. Right. Uh, this, uh, uh, yeah, you're right. This is a very complicated, multi-layered. You've got a lot of different uh, people with a lot of different goals. Um, uh, but at the end of the day, the Japanese are the ones with the guns on the island. <laughs> Speaking of which, so if I could, um, there's there's just so much here, and I and I know we're skipping a lot. And I apologize, but that's what your that's podcast what's is. That's what your podcast is for. They can go listen to yeah. you. So I did want to ask uh, <laughs> when so, I when I get there in like three years' time. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So how and when did Taiwan become a part of the theater of war uh, during World War II? Ah, well, during the second phase, mm -hmm. they started focusing more on uh, industry. You know, let's get electricity across the island. Oh, wow. Let's build up industry, especially textiles and chemicals. Mm -hmm. And then when World War I happened, Taiwan's economy boomed because they were basically making supplies for war. Right. And that was fantastic for them. Yeah. And then when it came into post-World War II, sorry, sorry, post-World War I. Right. Yeah, there were various things, you know, uprisings in China and some Taiwanese wanted to be a part of that and others didn't. More political shenanigans will sort of skip over for now. Mm -hmm. But then at the end of the second phase or start of the third phase was the um, uh, Marco Polo Bridge incident. Right. And I mean, I'm, I'm sure you've covered this in your story, but the, the Marco Polo Bridge incident was essentially the start of the second Sino-Japanese War. Mm-hmm. Uh, some argue that that's actually the start of World War II because it eventually ties in with the rest of the fighting. Others say World War II started separately and then this got involved. Right. I don't know which way you want to argue that. Uh, I'd rather not. <laughs> sure. No, it's splitting hairs. We don't need to. We don't need to go into that. Yeah. But once that war started, and Japan was then fighting against China. Mm -hmm. They started using all of their colonies to help develop war materials. Ooh, right. So Taiwan's economy shifted. I mean, it had done some war materials during World War I. Mm -hmm. But now there was a huge shift away from that towards, you know, getting as many military equipment and vehicles and tanks and boots and whatever people need right. out. And also there was another 
shift in terms of how the Taiwanese people were treated. Mm. So the Taiwanese were always treated as subjects of the empire. Right. You know, you you are now under our jurisdiction. You do what we tell you to. Mm-hmm. But in schooling, things started changing. They started trying to train people to understand Taiwan's place in the greater Japanese empire, to try and encourage them to think of themselves more as Japanese. Oh. And they were never really given the, the status of citizen. You know, it's always Japanese first, uh, our colonies second, and then everyone else third. Right. And maybe the Taiwanese indigenous below that. But we want you to see yourselves as Japanese and part of Japan. Mm. And they managed to get a number of Taiwanese people, uh, both indigenous and, you know, Chinese descent, right. to sign up to join the military. Which was uh, quite an interesting step because they also used some of those people when they were fighting in China. Oh, wow. Which uh, <laughs> was quite a, quite a thing. I mean, you obviously yeah. declaring your side there. Yes. Good gracious. That, that's asking mm. a lot of the Taiwanese. You never quite know where their true loyalty is at until mm. that moment they start shooting, I guess. But, but again, you're also in that situation of <sighs> things have been so disruptive mm-hmm. and changed so often, and I never really had a true cultural identity to start with. Right. Who am I? Yeah. Do I owe a patriotic duty to anyone? Uh, or if not just to the people who live around me. Mm-hmm. And so for them, they might have, some of them were, were literally going, well, we're part of Japan now. Yeah. Technically, we are Japanese, so we should do what's right for, the, for our great country. Mm-hmm. Others are going, well, we'll do this for now. But when we return, we still want independence from Japan, but we want to be our own people. Right. And the ones who are still loyal to China probably didn't sign up to join the war. Very conflicting. Um, that I wonder if it divided families. It certainly probably divided communities. Uh, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. sure at parts it did. Right. Um, I think most opposition actually came from the elite, mm. but it wasn't. It, it wasn't. It hadn't been for a long time any armed opposition. It was political opposition and literary opposition. Right. But when we got to 1939, mm-hmm. industrial production for the first time in Taiwan, exceeded agricultural production. Wow. Which was a, a huge shift for, for Taiwan. They'd never had that before. Yeah. But of course, aiding in the war effort and there being a war mm-hmm. meant Taiwan became a valid military target. Yes. Now, initially it was largely ignored. I mean, Japan used it a lot. They used the Taiwanese port, uh, ports mm-hmm. very strategically for their, their ships. But when America got involved in the war, they started looking at Taiwan as, well, there's one of their supply lines. We need to see what we can do to stop that. Right. Yeah, I mean, okay, they they actually went the first. The first people to come Mm -hmm. and uh, bomb Taiwan, Mm -hmm. it was in 1938, were the Russians. Really? They, yeah, on Red Army Day, you know, it's a a Chinese thing, you know, supporting the Red Army, Mm -hmm. they sent in a small detachment of planes and dropped about 280 bombs on Zhongshan Airport, which is in Taipei. Right. Uh, Didn't really do much damage. They destroyed a few planes, they damaged Mm -hmm. the runway a bit, but otherwise not much. Symbolic. And then they never came back. Right. (laughs) They they, they just sort of did it to say, hey, China, we're on your side. Let's do this World War II thing. Right. (laughs) Yeah, but but you're right. It is going to become a target, and the Americans, especially MacArthur, they're coming up from the Philippines. Uh, I imagine it's about to get very uncomfortable in Taiwan as the mm. war progresses. But what, what's interesting is, mm. even though Russia did that, right, they then made a public statement saying, "Oh, it was a Soviet volunteer team. Uh, they did it. It's got nothing to do with us, the government. It wasn't the USSR, yeah. uh, because we have a neutrality pact with Japan. So of course we didn't do it." I wonder if that really worked, but I, yeah, anyway, but they had to say that, right? Yeah, they, they did have to say that. Yeah. But yeah, so Taiwan was then propelled into the industrial age. Everything was developing. Right. And then, when was it? In 1943 mm-hmm. is when the U.S. first started going, okay, let, let's start bombing Taiwan. 
So now I, they claim. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Just, just real quick. I mean, j- just the the sad irony. So Taiwan's been built up from almost, you know, with all due respect, almost nothing. It's become this industrial center, and now. A lot of it, I imagine, is going to be bombed for at least a year by the Americans and British and whoever else. I mean, it's just, it's a very unfortunate thing that war is. Yeah. Well, I mean, it was over th- uh, 43 to 45, over three years. Right. And, you know, sometimes they're more intense than others. Sure. But at least according to what the U.S. have said, uh-huh. they've largely focused on military targets or industrial targets. Mm. How much of that is true? Sure. Well, yeah, that leads to question. We'll, we'll look at it later. Right. Um, so, yeah, in f- 1943 was the first bombing raid, which was done on Shinju Airport, which is just sort of west of Taiwan, uh, of, of Taipei. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then there wasn't that much after that. There were a few little bombing raids. Right. And all of them were daytime raids. Hmm. <laughs> and, yeah, until a certain point, and, until things really started ramping up, because... Obviously, same year, 43, we had the uh, Cairo Declaration. Mm -hmm. You know, Churchill, Roosevelt, Chiang Kai-shek, all agreeing that, oh, yeah, Japan has to give away its colonies and Taiwan will go back to China. Right. And then in 1944, uh, uh, FDR met with Admiral Nimitz and, you know, Douglas MacArthur, the general. Mm -hmm. And there they started discussing, okay, what are we going to do next? Are we going to take Luzon, the northern Philippine island? Or are we going to take Formosa? And there was a a huge disagreement between them. Mm -hmm. Um, Various people, uh, yeah, because they said, okay, um, Taiwan is closer to Japan. If we take Taiwan, we can drop heavier bomb loads on Japan. Yeah. It's a great strategic. They said, oh, but but, uh, we need to take the Philippines properly. We can't just leave it half finished. Right. So if we stick then we take it, then we won't get attacked from behind. Oh, yeah, but if we take Taiwan, it's this wonderful wedge between Taiwan and the continent, and that's going to cut their supply lines. And this argument went back and forth. Um, Nimitz yeah, was going, yeah, let's get Luzon. One of his underlings called King wanted Taiwan. MacArthur said, no, get all of the Philippines first. <laughs> right. He promised he'd return. So he's got to say that. And others said, oh, skip both of those. Let's just go and take the Ryukyu Islands, you know, Hokinawa, and invade Japan from there. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, so in the end, they decided, let's take Luzon. Right. Because uh, it was a former colony of America, and it'll, you know, increase our prestige, or, sorry, restore the prestige, right. Right. make it look good for us. So that's what they did. Mm. And then they planned an invasion of Taiwan. This was going to be for the autumn that year, sort of September, November. Right. And they said, okay, well, then if we invade the island, what's going to happen? Well, it'll trigger a massive Japanese response. They will invade down from the north if we land in the south. Uh, This is going to be too costly. We're going to get trapped there. Let's just skip this invasion. I I can't help but think of Taiwan's possible future if America had gone in and occupied the island. Who knows how that thing would... But 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 that's what makes history so fascinating. Well, yeah, there's speculation. I mean... The what-ifs. Technically, according to the agreement, they would have to hand it back to China. Right. But if they then are like, well, this part isn't Japanese, we control the South, would they just give the rest of the island to... I don't know, it's confusing. It, yeah. It gets complicated real quick. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And then, you know, with the Battle of Later Island in 1944, mm-hmm. uh, that's when the USA came to control the Philippines. Right. And with that done, you needed all those troops there in the Philippines to hold down the area. So there, could be in, there couldn't be any invasion of Taiwan. Right. Because any extra soldiers they needed, they needed for the invasion of Japan. Yeah, they were so extra. instead, yeah, yeah, instead they're like, okay, bombing campaign. Let's mm-hmm. just bomb the hell out of Taiwan. Right. Oh. And it was, it was during this time that, because uh, as we got into the end of the, the, the war time, the last few governor generals of Taiwan went back to being military generals. Oh, the circle is now 
goes back around. Gotcha. So in 1936, you had a, a Navy admiral coming in, um, quite a, a decorated guy, very interesting. And then the next, uh, that was, um, oh, he's got a lovely name, right? Kobayashi. <laughs> <laughs> Kobayashi Sezo. Right. So yeah, right. yeah, he was fantastic. So he, he was there till 1940, and then he had to go el- off elsewhere, I think, because they needed him for military maneuvers instead. Mm-hmm. Right. And he was then replaced by Hasegawa Kiyoshi in 1940, who was another uh, Navy admiral. Mm. Uh, huge war record. And from what I hear, a really likable guy. Because mm, okay. after the war, he was, you know, many of these leaders were brought up in war charges. Right. And his were dismissed. People were just so taken by how well-spoken he was and, and right. how, you know, sorry he was for the war and things that happened. And he was let off. Interesting. But right at the end of the war, 1944 to 1940, actually December yeah. 1944 to the end of the war, October 1945, you had Ando Rikichi. Mm-hmm. And he was a, a military general. Mm. Um, that's a military general. He was a, he was a general in the army as opposed to the navy. Right. Uh, also had quite a long history, but also had some rather dodgy spots. Right. Uh, it's, some people claim that he was – he didn't really start the second Sino-Japanese War, but that he caused a lot of trouble mm-hmm. because when that war was happening, uh, Japanese soldiers were in southern China and they needed to attack various areas. Right. So they turned to their neighbors, Vichy France. So France had fallen right. and they had a new – Government controlling a, a third of France, I guess, trying to be loyal to Germany so that they weren't destroyed. Mm-hmm. And it also controlled all of their little scattered uh, colonies around the world, their little um, dominions. Mm-hmm. And one of them was French Indochina. So today it's sort of Laos, Cambodia, bits of Vietnam, a little bit of China. Mm-hmm. And Japan wanted to move through this area to then attack uh, China in a different place. Right. So they handed the French into China an ultimatum, you know. Yeah. The ultimatum was let our troops go through an attack and close all your supply routes to China because that's where China was getting its supplies from. In fact, it was the last entry point of supplies. Right. And so this debate went back and forth, people deciding what they wanted to do. And if they were going to follow it or not. And eventually, um, Rikichi got bored with this. He's like, you know, we're waiting too long. I don't know what to do. Right. They've told us to have a hold off because negotiations are happening. I can't be bothered waiting. And so yeah. he just ordered his troops across. And they marched through Indochina. They ended up having some some fighting uh, for about five days in September. And of course, once he invades, Japan's like, okay, well, we have to follow through with this. Yes. But after all of this happened and they gained control of various areas and they kept up the fight with China, they were so annoyed with Frikichi that he was recalled uh, in 1941. In fe- so, okay, a number of months later. Mm-hmm. But February the f- 1941, he was recalled to Japan and he was forced into retirement. Now, how dare you do that? Get out. Right. And then in September that same year, he was recalled to service, promoted up to full general, and sent to govern Taiwan. Uh, Well, actually, he was sent to govern the military forces in Taiwan. Right. uh, The 10th Area Army, which was basically just the Taiwanese Defense Force, the the garrison, because Mm -hmm. it was such a small, they couldn't invade anywhere. And when the previous governor general left, they just made him the new governor. Right. Was he... Did he treat the locals well, or do we know? Or I haven't found much on that, but okay. given his record, he yeah, he seems a bit of a racist. I, I, right. He didn't seem to like anyone. He didn't care about the Japanese. In fact, he was had up after the war on war crimes mm. and essentially was um, taken to China, put in a prison in Shanghai while the trial was being done. And according to sources, committed suicide in Shanghai prison. Or he might have been helped. Who knows? Yeah, you see, that's the thing I don't know. Right. 
if the Japanese, uh, sorry, if the Chinese mm-hmm. really wanted to make a, a send a message, yeah, they would have had him up in court and thrown the book at him and made a huge spectacle of it. Yeah, but they couldn't because he was dead. Now oh. was that the old samurai seppuku? I'm going to kill myself to get out of this, right? Or was it? We don't have enough on this guy. We really want to make him look bad. Let's just kill him off and say he killed himself. I, I don't know. It's yeah. the space of time. It's difficult to say. Either way, it's messy. Uh, yeah. yeah. Either way, it's messy. Yeah. So so what happens to Taiwan after uh, the, uh, the Japanese Empire surrenders? I mean, it's, it sounds like it's in a very strange political quandary oh. at this point. <laughs> Oh, it it got quite weird because, you know, right. they Japan officially surrenders. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay, we we give up. Right. And then, oh, I got to find the date. I, do you remember the date offhand of when the announcement went out of from the emperor surrendering? Oh God, was that um, the bombs were dropped the sixth and the ninth? Was that the fifteenth September? Something, yeah, it's something around there, 15th, 17th, something like that, something September. Like that. Yeah, I remember. After that surrender, mm-hmm. in Taiwan, nothing seemed to happen. Right. So they stood around looking awkward for a day or so. <laughs> and then the government just kept running. You know, yeah. police went out, did walk their beats, things right. were run. They just kept everything until mm-hmm. near the end of the following month, 25th of October, Finally, someone arrived who could actually accept the surrender. Oh. Now, various people had arrived before that, but they weren't in that position. Right. Some of them were there just to sort of gather intel for various groups. Some were there to see what they could steal while no one was looking. Sure. Yeah, some were there to root out communists in a place that had been under Japanese. basically been a police state for 50 years and before yeah. that had been. Yeah, so there were no communists there. I don't know exactly. what they were looking for. Exactly. But I think mainly they were looking for people who wanted Taiwan to become independent, mm-hmm. and they wanted to make lists of people who had benefited under Japanese rule so they could exploit them later. Wow. So it's time for revenge and um, what have you. You know, because war and uh, occupation is always ugly. Now it's time for some payback on whatever level. Mm. So, yeah, on the 25th of October, someone finally arrived. Right. Uh, this was Chen Yi. Um, and he arrived there and he officially accepted Taiwan back into Chinese possession. Right. And the other Allied officials there were slightly nervous because they were like, you're just meant to take control for now, not officially accept it back. That's, we haven't done the paperwork yeah. yet. <laughs> going to uh, meaning they're trying to stall because they're trying to find a way to not give it to China because right. China's going through that civil war. Yeah. But, yeah, they officially accepted it back. It's Taiwan Retrocession Day. Right. And then the new government essentially turned to pillaging the country. Oh. Because the soldiers they brought in were quite young recruits. Most of them were uneducated, even by Taiwanese standards now. Right. I mean, as I mentioned before, with the UN CAM, some people would come to people's houses and steal stuff. Like, I'm going to steal your bicycle. Right. But I don't know what a bicycle is, so I'm just going to carry it away with me. God. <laughs> they just thought it was some sort of machine. You know? Right. But they had guns, and so they were going to take things because they could. Absolutely. And so they stripped down a lot of the industry that was there. They sold off as much as they could to China to make money for themselves. Right. And then about four years later, they realized they were losing the war. Chiang Kai-shek stopped the export of stuff from Taiwan and started sending stuff back to Taiwan because they needed to flee there and then rebuild it. So it, it was a complete mess. Yeah. The one interesting thing, which I think is um, absolutely ludicrous, mm-hmm. is that first year, uh, 1945, in December, and a bombing investigation team arrived to see what damage the bombing had done on Taiwan. Oh, right. Okay. But it was run by people from the USA. So they were there to investigate their own bombings. Mm. Mm-mm. Okay. And they're like, oh, yes, um, we did damage to various cities. Like we had the huge Taipei air raid where we 
decimated parts of the city. But the rest of it was mostly <clears throat> uh, military targets, you know, right. railways, roads, and industry. <clears throat> Nothing else, <clears throat> we promise. <clears throat> give us an A minus. Yeah. <laughs> Jeez. So basically, they were covering their own tracks by sending yeah. their own investigators. But they, they did get a lot of interesting information, like they looked at how many trains were actually working in the country, or mm. if you cobbled together bits, how many functioning trains you had, and like, oh, 198 were destroyed, you know, we've got 40 left or something like that. It's, right. you know, huge damage was done. 60% um, of Taiwan's uh, electricity generation was gone. Uh, over 6,000 people were dead, over 9,000 were injured, mm -hmm. nearly 300,000 were homeless, you know, and they put down most of the bombing damage to the U.S. Fifth Air Force. Right. I, I don't know if that means they should be condemned or given a medal, uh, but, you know, you did the most damage. Exactly. Well, well done. It's war, uh, so congratulations. And now that the war is over with, shame on you. <clears throat> so it's, it's convoluted. Yeah. I mean, the most hit was Kaohsiung, the major port city down in the south. Mm -hmm. It received 20% of all the raids. Oh, my goodness. And so it's, of all the Taiwanese cities, it's probably the most rebuilt of cities. Right. It's, it's a bit like um, if you go to the Netherlands, you go to Rotterdam. Rotterdam is, the buildings there mm -hmm. are very different to most of the rest of the, the, the country because... You, you don't have as many of those old traditional buildings left because most got bombed. There's a lot of new development there, oh. a lot of new styles of building. Some people absolutely hate it. Some people absolutely love it. You know, it's one of those things like Marmite or licorice. <laughs> but yeah. Kaohsiung is quite similar. They've right. had a lot of areas they've had to rebuild. And when uh, Taiwan went through a lot of its rebuilding, uh, beyond that, in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, it was – huge unimaginative concrete blocks with then just tiles pasted over the outside. Mm. Personally, I think that Taiwan actually has some rather ugly cities. They've got beautiful parts to them, right? but a lot of it is ugly. And the, the tiles they put on often get dirty over time. And most of them panel them in these little white tiles. So they almost look like bathrooms mm. and then they all go moldy on the outside. And uh, it just, yeah. Yeah, the Taiwanese way. mentality is, well, you live on the inside of the building. Keep right. the inside looking nice. Who cares about the outside? Yes and no. <laughs> but, that, <that's>, <laughs> <laughs> but but again, that's like yeah, focus on the essentials. Uh, yeah, I'm not I'm not outside. I'm not. I don't live outside of my building, so I can see that. But still, <laughs> still. Yeah, it's it's it, for us. It's a different mentality. Right. Um, well, James, I want to thank you very much for your time. And for you listeners out there, we have skipped so much. And I want to apologize to James because this, this could easily be, even though fascinating, a three-hour conversation. And, and no one should have to spend that much time with me. <laughs> Ten um, hours, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. No, but I, like I said, I'm up to episode 10 on your, uh, your podcast, Taiwan Through Time. I'm looking forward to, to more of it. And the mm. details that you put in there, because this, this truly is, for me... Uh, a window into another world because there's just so much I don't know about it. And I'm glad you started the podcast. And I know it can be frustrating at times, but hang in there because people like me are learning a lot and enjoying a lot from it. And so, again, thank you very much for that. Oh, you're welcome. And thank you for having me on. Um, it's been a, a great pleasure chatting with you again. And I don't know, maybe we'll do it again in the future. We should definitely do it again. And, and just to, and I have to say this because. You know better than I do that the current political state of Taiwan is very tension-filled and complicated and layered and all that stuff. And so how you kind of tackle that as, as you get to those you know, more recent times is going to be, is going to be uh, fascinating for me. But um, again, I'm just glad that you live there and you get a firsthand account. And so I really do look forward uh, to going through your episodes. Oh, well, thank you very much. <laughs> Hey everyone, Ray here. Just once again, I wanted to remind you that on the last episode, episode 392, there is a second episode that is the continuation of the series in North Africa. Just want to make sure you're aware. On with the show. Hello. 
and thank you for listening to the history of World War II podcast, episode 393, part 2, Operation Harpoon. Last time, the bulk of the British 8th Army was heading back to the Egyptian frontier, given how Rommel had outmaneuvered them, getting around the main defensive line, hitting and destroying individual units, and finally making the Knightsbridge box, as well as the Gazala line, untenable. And yet, the morale of 8th Army was still high. This was probably due to them retreating. Soldiers are normally happy to get away from the fighting, but also because so few of 8th Army had actually been set upon by the Panzers. And finally, Tobruk was still safe. Well, that was about to change. As the various Allied units moved back, there was talk of Rommel's growing supply line and how, with each mile, it became more vulnerable to Allied air attacks. Which was true enough. But what if the Axis vessels could land at Tobruk? Very quickly, there would be far fewer grins coming from the officers of 8th Army. But what would have revived the men of 8th Army, had they known, was that Hitler had just made another mistake. First, he had not taken Malta when it was at its lowest ebb early on, and more recently, with the British sea vessels being told to leave the island as they could no longer be protected. That would have been another good time. Worse for de Fuhrer is that he should have moved against Malta while the second German Air Force unit had been based in Sicily for the winter. Now, they were back in the Ukraine to harass the Russians, when they could have been putting the finishing touches on the Axis' latest acquisition, namely Malta. And this was about to be coupled with London's latest attempt at resupplying the Mediterranean island. Yes, it did not go as well as hoped. During the Battle of Knightsbridge Box, an operation named Harpoon was sent out. Or rather, it consisted of two convoys, one coming from Gibraltar and the other from Alexandria. There was hope that these two convoys would get through with the much-needed supplies, as at the beginning of June, carrier HMS Eagle had been able to deliver 63 more Spitfires to Malta, which now had 95 serviceable fighters. But that only meant so much without food and fuel. And just before this delivery, planes from Malta had bombed the airfields on Sicily and southern Italy. Next, just before the convoy set out on June 11th and June 12th, reconnaissance flights had been sent out from Gibraltar, Malta, and Egypt to seek out the Italian Navy. With the green light for Operation Harpoon given, though more out of desperation than the way was actually clear, Plans were made for that dreaded moment of when the supply ships would be departed from their escorts and only protected by air cover from Malta or a few remaining destroyers for the last leg of the journey. Still, the Desert Air Force would do its part by attacking Axis airfields in North Africa. Additionally, 201 General Reconnaissance Groups would fly over the ships, providing anti-submarine cover while a small party of men would actually land on Crete to sabotage the Axis aircraft stationed there. All this prep work had been done. Now it was time to see who the god of war favored more. As Malta was struggling with supplies, which weakened them in all ways that mattered, the convoy dubbed Vigorous, coming from Alexandria, was planned by Rear Admiral Henry Harwood, recently made C&C of the Mediterranean fleet, and by Air Marshal Arthur Tedder. They decided that Rear Admiral Philip Vian would command the convoy and the escorts, called Force A. And Vian was told how he would defend the convoy that was coming from Egypt, if and when it came under attack. Should the Italian warships show up, Vian was to immediately lay down smoke, while a few of the escorts actually started spitting out torpedoes. Hopefully, the Italians would be quickly wounded, as experience showed that once they had tasted a little of their own blood or smelled smoke coming from their own ship, they tended to turn and head for home. Should this fail, then the real plan to sink the enemy vessels would be taken over by the Allied air or submarines. Overall, the commanders did not want the escorts 
mixing it up with the Italian big boys, that being their battleships. Because the British battleships HMS Queen Elizabeth and Valiant were still being repaired. It would have been an uneven fight, to say the least. Still, Vian's Force A, the escorts, they were an impressive assemblage. Four light cruisers, an anti-aircraft cruiser, three more cruisers, 26 destroyers, four corvettes, two minesweepers, two motor torpedo boats, and lastly, should they be needed, two rescue ships. But just to give a better impression, the 31-year-old battleship HMS Centurion was added on. Hopefully, the Italians would think this was a modern battleship and not the ancient beast that had participated in the Battle of Jutland during the Great War. And lastly, nine submarines would be sent with this convoy coming out of Alexandria. Perhaps they could end any threat before it got too close to the supply ships. Meanwhile, the other half of Operation Harpoon left Gibraltar on June 12th. This convoy, MW4, a.k.a. Harpoon, was composed of six merchantmen, one of them being the American oil tanker Kentucky, and on board her were 39,000 tons of cargo and oil. The other ships were three British vessels, the Dutch Tenem Bar, and another American vessel, besides the Kentucky. Protecting them all was for sex, comprised of the anti-aircraft cruiser HMS Cairo, nine destroyers, the fast mine layer HMS Welshman, and a few more smaller ships. Also protecting the ships coming from Gibraltar, though staying further away for their own protection, was the battleship HMS Malaya, carriers Argus and Eagle, the cruisers Kenya, Charybdis, and Liverpool, along with the ubiquitous destroyers. A day and a half after departing Gibraltar, the Western convoy was attacked by the Italian sub Uarsic at 2.52 a.m. June 14th. One torpedo was launched and an explosion was heard. But what the Italian crew did not know was that the fish had exploded prematurely. What could have been a disaster for the target ship turned out to be some slight damage. When the sun was just up enough to fly by, an Italian reconnaissance plane was spotted just north of the northwestern coast of Algeria. Fortunately for the Allies, two fighters were quickly sent up, and they splashed the enemy plane before it could report what the crew had saw. Also around that time, 6.05 a.m., the Italian sub Giada spotted the carrier Eagle and fired two torpedoes. However it happened, the explosions went off before the fish reached the carrier's hull. The carrier's personnel made a note of the explosions, but no damage was found, whereas the Italians claimed to have heard the two explosions, plus a third, which they interpreted to mean something on the eagle had detonated. The Italians were wrong, and the sub was about to be harassed as the older fighters aboard Eagle, her normal complement, had been removed to make room for more modern fighters to take on what was coming, like this submarine. And it would be this change of planes that would end up contributing to Harpoon's very limited success by shooting down nine enemy planes, with two more claimed, though without proof, over the next few days, and the Eagle would lose one hurricane for their pains. If only that Italian subcrew had been correct with their assessment against the Eagle. Almost two hours later, another Italian aircraft was spotted and had in return found the convoy at 7.45 a.m., about 100 miles or 170 kilometers southwest of Sardinia. Unfortunately for the convoy, there were some 175 fighters and bombers on Sardinia at the moment, a figure much larger than the British thought possible. Another thing the British did not know, but were about to find out, is that the Italians were not on general patrols, but rather they knew what they were looking for. Thanks to the intercepted and decrypted messages of U.S. military attaché in Egypt, Colonel Bonner Fellers, 
He would report to Washington what the Allies were up to, and the Italians got every word of it. Now, their hunt was on. The first air attack, launched from Sardinia, managed to evade the air patrols and swoop down on the Dutch vessel Tannenbar. More specifically, the convoy was set upon by 28 Savoa S-79 torpedo bombers, protected by 20 Maquis fighters. This group wisely broke into two sections and approached both columns of the convoy. The port column responded with intense AA fire and fighter coverage, who just happened to be in the right place at the right time. However, the starboard column had a gap in between two of its destroyers, and that was enough for the torpedo bombers to dive down and line up their shots. At 11.35 a.m., the HMS Liverpool and the Dutch Tenenbaum at the rear of the convoy were hit. The Tenenbaum went down in a matter of minutes with the loss of 23 crew, whereas the Liverpool had sustained damage and flooding, but had the latter soon under control. Still, only one engine was now operational, so the Liverpool accepted a tow from two naval ships, one of those being the HMS Antelope. Liverpool was ordered to turn around and head back to Gibraltar. The stricken Liverpool would reach Gibraltar on June 17th, but only after being shot up some more by air attacks on its way back west. On June 14th, the day of the air attack, it was decided to send the fast mine layer HMS Welchman on ahead to Malta alone, as she had cargo aboard, specifically ammunition. The run was made, and then the Welshman turned around and joined the escorts, who were by then on their way back to Gibraltar. Still, as the Straits of Sicily had been reached, per the plan, the more distant and heavy-hitting escorts turned around and headed back for the rock. The next day, June 15th, the convoy was attacked anew, as it passed by Sardinia late the day before, and now began a route that was more to the southeast to make directly for Malta. Problem was, they first had to pass by the island of Pantelleria, which is almost in a line between the shortest route between Sicily and Tunisia. Also, as Pantelleria was about 200 kilometers, or 120 miles west by northwest of Malta, there was plenty of access planes on that island waiting their turn which again came on June 15th. Not only did the Italian planes strafe the convoy, but the attack was joined in on by warships of the Italian 7th Division and German dive bombers manned by Italian pilots. Following the general plan, though this was the convoy from Gibraltar, not Alexandria, the remaining escorts quickly laid down smoke, and some of them went right after the Italian surface ships with their torpedoes, hoping to score a lucky hit. But before this service engagement would be over, both sides would draw blood. And it was during this fighting that the Axis forces were able to stop the vessels Birdwan, Chant, and Kentucky due to damage. And before too long, these vessels would be abandoned by their crews and sunk, which left the Troilus and Arari still on their way to Malta. And not that the battle had turned out much better for the escorts. By now, the cruiser Cairo was damaged by taking two rounds of Italian gunfire. Also damaged was the minesweeper Hebe, but it was the Bedouin, listing heavily, that had to be taken under tow by the Partridge. Yet when four more Italian ships showed up, the Bedouin was untied at 2.30 p.m. as the destroyer Partridge had to defend herself. Later that day, June 15th, the Bedouin succumbed to her wounds and sunk. The Partridge, with no charge to care for, started back for Gibraltar. But it must be noted that the Italian SM-79 bomber that had finished off the Bedouin was herself shot out of the sky by that same doomed ship. Also, the Italians had a few of their ships now under tow as the British destroyers braved the danger and got in close for a few effective shots. 
But as this was Malta's time of general doom and gloom, the destruction of the ships trying to feed and sustain them was not over. That evening of June 15th, the surviving supply ships and their escorts closed in on Malta, only to hit friendly mines and suffer even further damage. The destroyers Badsworth and Matchless and the merchantmen Orari were further damaged by these mines. But it would be the Polish destroyer Kowajik that would be lost just after midnight. Of all of them, all of the ships, the merchantmen and the escorts of both convoys, only the Troilus sailed into Grand Harbor without nary a scratch. Getting back to the other convoy, Vigorous, coming from Port Syed, Halfaya, Egypt. It had left Alexandria at the same time as Harpoon had departed Gibraltar to force the enemy to split their forces. Again, Vigorous was made up of 11 merchantmen and numerous Allied warships and submarines. But those submarines, the supposed ace against the coming Axis warships, had nothing to offer against the Italian air attacks and they dominated the contest of this convoy. Before Vigorous turned back for Egypt, late on June 15th, two ships had already been lost, and one of those was the Agtakirk, a vessel owned by the same company that had owned the now-lost Tannenbar. All told, as only two ships reached Malta from both convoys, carrying some 15,000 tons of supplies, it was something but not enough. The rationing on the island would continue. Hopefully, the harvest coming soon would be a good one. But it was the loss of the tanker Kentucky that forced a pullback of Malta's planes and plans. For the foreseeable future, fighters would be sent out over the bombers who normally attacked Sicily. In other words, with supply so low, defense was the order of the day, and only at a limited range. Clearly, these were Malta's darkest days. The year prior, 1941, 30 of 31 merchant ships had reached the island. During the first seven months of 1942, of the 30 supply ships sent out, 10 had been sunk, another 10 turned back due to damage, three were lost or forced to turn back once close to Malta, which left only seven ships getting through with their supplies. This was no way to win a war, or even to stay in one. Something had to give. As bad as Operation Harpoon turned out to be, the defenders just had to hold on until Hitler sent more of his air crews on Sicily back to the Eastern Front, and there was word of this. And if the British subs could keep bringing in aviation fuel, then soon Malta's planes would be back in the business of strangling Rommel's lifeline from Italy. And the potential good news kept coming. Churchill told Auchinleck, now that American divisions were arriving in Britain, the British 8th Armored Division and 44th Infantry Division would be released from home defense and sent to Egypt. They should arrive by the end of June, perhaps the middle of July. Also, 11 anti-aircraft regiments were also being sent over. Hopefully, they would be able to give the Axis pilots flying over Malta a nasty surprise. Added to this, Auchinleck had already ordered the New Zealand division back from Syria. And from what London could tell from its many sources, and one of those was top secret, that being ultra, Rommel was not going to be receiving similar reinforcements. No, the Battle of North Africa was far from over. With this being the case, the CNC Auchinleck flew to 8th Army Headquarters at Salem. It was agreed that Tobruk would remain under 8th Army's command, and General Gott and his staff would be responsible for the frontier defensive position that was being set up. Meanwhile, General Norrie would go to the frontier with his 30th Corps and prepare a sizable mobile strike force once Rommel came this far east or that Ritchie thought his counterthrust was ready. 
Then the collective C&Cs sent their thoughts to London by saying, given all this new information, we hope, therefore, that Tobruk should be able to hold out until operations for relief are successfully completed after resumption of our offensive. That was nice and all, but no one asked Rommel what he thought of all this uplifting news. Not that it mattered, as he was already busy making plans for the capture of Tobruk. He had put up with so much from the enemy, from Rome, and from Berlin, but now he had his eye on the prize, and nothing was going to stop him. Certainly not a lack of reinforcements. On June 18th, the Desert Fox told his men to use the 19th to assemble and gather intelligence. For on the morrow, they ride for Tobruk.